Hello, I'm Justin McMicken. I'm a crop protection and cropping system specialist located at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And today I'm going to be discussing soybean insects in the Midwest. So this slide is uh, designed to provide you an overview of what we plan to cover uh, during this presentation. And so we're going to start with early things prior to emergence, those below ground feeders that show up under certain environmental conditions and situations, and then turn our focus towards some veg vegetative stage uh, insects that show up, or bean leaf beetle and thistle caterpillar and soybean gallmage. And then we'll spend the remainder of the talk really focusing on the reproductive stage, which involves a lot of our defoliators and other things like decti stem borer and uh, soybean aphid. So to start off with the prior to emergence and below ground insects, these are soil dwelling uh, soybean pests. You can see three of them in this image. They're uh, most often gonna show up under our cool and wet conditions. So if you're scouting a field and seeing some poor emergence or missing plants in the field, it's probably one of these three culprits that you're looking at. So the first one we'll focus on in on is seed corn maggot. That's this photo you see here. And in uh, most areas and most states each year, if we have some cool and wet conditions, this insect will show up. It typically shows up whenever we have uh, some green manure is in a cover crop or we're uh, looking at some manure applications that have been incorporated via tillage. And what happens is there's an adult fly of this particular insect that is looking for vegetation or, or uh, manure or, or vegetation that's been incorporated to lay its eggs into. Uh, there are some nice models to follow this insect and when the adults are active and can be useful in determining uh, whether or not that might be a risk. Uh, the next one is wireworms. Wireworms are a complicated group of a whole bunch of different species. Uh, they can range anywhere from a year to up to six years in their lifespan in the soil. Uh, they're very patchy in their distribution in the field. And this insect likes really cold soils. So it'll be up near the rooting zone of, of soybeans feeding on those roots. And once the temperature gets up into the 70 degree Fahrenheit area, it will move down in the soil profile quite a bit. And so if you see damage, you may not be able to recover these insects depending on when you're out there and uh, how warm the soil conditions have gotten. And the last one on the list is white grubs, which is also a complex of different species. Uh, our Japanese beetle is an example of an annual white grub, and we have some three-year grubs as well. The three-year or longer than one-year lifespan is the ones that pre present the greater risk to soybean uh, and other, other crops as well, because they'll feed on the roots over a longer period of time earlier in the season compared to our annual grubs, which usually are usually finished feeding by then and, and emerging as adults. And so the key thing is uh, with white grubs is often this happens whenever we're turning under sod or other things. They like to lay their eggs into grasses and other things. Uh, so if you are in a field where things have recently been turned over and planted to soybeans, that may be a possible thing that would show up. After getting out and our plants have emerged and even just slightly poked through the ground, one of the first insects you might come across with on soybeans is bean leaf beetle. Uh, this insect overwinters as an adult, and you can see already at the top here, there are several different color variations of this insect. And you may be saying, well, those four dots look pretty diagnostic, but actually it's the triangle behind the head uh, uh, that, that is most uh, diagnostic of this, this particular insect. Uh, sometimes they don't have any spots. Uh, they can also be yellow in color. So a lot of different color variations. Um, in the season and early in the season, they'll start on alfalfa and sweet clover and other plants. And it's the first planted soybeans in the area that you're likely to find these on. Um, and so if you have an early planted soybean field that you're visiting, uh, that's the most likely place that they'll show up first. And they're pretty good at hiding. This is showing on some alfalfa, but on soybean, they'll hide underneath the leaves as well. Uh, and so scouting for this insect is uh, walking along a row, uh, looking down at the plants, trying not to disturb them as they'll fall off and onto the soil and hide pretty quickly. Uh, but it's good to scout a couple areas of the field for this. This is another one that can show up along field borders or edges. Uh, we're going to hear about this insect again as we get into the reproductive stages. It is a defoliator like it is in the vegetative stages, uh, but in the reproductive stages as pods begin to form in the plant, it will feed on those pods. One other thing to note with bean leaf uh, beetle is that it can transmit bean pod model virus. Uh, not very effectively, but it can cause problems if it is very early in the season, just after the plants emerge. Once we get into the early reproductive stages, that virus is less effective. Uh, so something to consider if you see bean leaf beetles in the field. The next one I'm going to spend a little more time on because this is actually a new species that recently 
uh, was found in 2018 and described in 2019. Soybean gall midge or Resiliella maxima is the fly you see here on the image. They're quite small. It looks large in that photo, but it's, it's uh, about a, a quarter of an inch in size. Um, you're unlikely to ever see the adults in the field unless you're part of our trapping network, which is uh, not uh, about 36 fields across the United States or within the state, uh, states where we have infestations, which is South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, and the tip of Missouri. Uh, but this insect is, the larvae is what you're more likely to see, which is in this photo here. And this is the, the classic kind of what we hope to see when diagnosing this, which is orange larvae. They have a white larvae that is present prior in the first two stages of development. There is one other species that resembles this that I'll talk about a little bit later. They feed at the base of the plant and they start on the phloem and can feed on the xylem. And as they feed, they cut off the circulation to the plant. And that leads to the second photo on here, which is a dead and dying plants within the soybean field, which was taken in Nebraska. If you see this, you probably won't be in too much question and likely the people you're working with will be aware of soybean gallmage. What's more likely is that the plants won't be dead and you may see these infestations at the base of the plant. They are heavily, uh, the most likely uh, chance of finding this insect is along the field border as that's where the heaviest infestations occur. And you'll learn more about that in the next few slides. So to give you an idea of where this insect was as of 2020 or the end of that season, it's been found in 114 counties across five states. So depending on where your area is that you're this, uh, at this summer, you may be in counties that are already infested or not. If you're in one of those gray counties that's not been documented and you find this insect, please let your local extension uh, agents know about that or extension specialists uh, in those states. Um, this insect has uh, some special features in, in how it infests plants. And it starts with the development stage of soybeans. And I bring this up because this is an important scouting tool to understand when and where you might find this insect. So the adults lay eggs on the, on the plants once they produce a fissure or injury, as you can see here, this V1 stage plant, which you can go back to your agronomy and soybean development, uh, has one trifoliate on it. And this is a, a picture at the base of the plant below the cotyledonary node. And you can see this is nice and smooth um, relative to this V2 stage plant, which is just occurs a, oh, five days later, uh, has these fissures or cracks forming. And that's where the adults lay their eggs uh, into those fissures or cracks. They can't break through uh, tissue, but they do lay them under those little fissures or cracks. So when you start to see those, that's when the plants become susceptible to infestation. Once the larvae start to feed within the plant, depending on the area or region that you're in, you may see dark discolorations at the base of the plant where that feeding site uh, begins to initiate. So this is below the cotyledonary node again, and you can see that blackening. Uh, in some cases, you may see an actual gall form, which matches the, the common name of the insect. But in a lot of cases, you may see the tissue is sunken away. As the larvae feed, they change in color from first being kind of white in appearance, which are some at the base of this picture, uh, to, to more orange. And that takes about 12 days for them to transition to orange. Uh, as they feed, and as I mentioned earlier, they will girdle the plants. And once the plants have been girdled or the, they've taken away the ability to move water or nutrients, the plants will wilt and die. And under really heavy infestations, you may see this happen within 21 days of first adult activity. So to begin scouting, we want to again begin scouting about 10 days after first adult emergence. And how would you know when adult emergence uh, occurs? If you're in an area where you expect to see or, or may see soybean gallmage, it might not be a bad idea to jot down this website, soybeangallmage.org. This is where we put a lot of the information on this insect. And you can also sign up for alerts on this pest when it first emerges to, to know when to begin scouting. So in the case of the image here, you see uh, we have last year's soybean field. So this was that really injured soybean field that we saw in the previous uh, slides. They overwinter in those sites where they cause injury. This becomes corn in a lot of areas uh, where this insect is the following year. And so the adults emerge usually in early to mid June uh, and move over to adjacent fields. And so this is a pretty easy insect to scout for. You could stay in the first row of soybeans as you can see here that's highlighted in yellow. And the best places to find this early in infestations is along or next to dense vegetation, trees or shrubs. Uh, behind those areas is where you're likely to first see this pest. In those areas, you can push over plants at the, uh, to get a, an exposure below the cotyledonary node. And you're looking for dark discoloration. So you see this plant has some dark discoloration here. 
as well as this one. This one has just got a, a light tinge of purple to it. That plant is likely uninfested, but you wanna pull up these plants that show those signs or symptoms. And you wanna peel back the tissue underneath those to see if you can locate the orange larvae. If you locate them and you're in a county that's not been documented, again, contact us uh, for, uh, for documenting those, those counties as uh, infested. As I mentioned earlier, not all orange larvae are soybean gall midge larvae. So this is uh, white mold gall midge. It showed up in uh, Minnesota and was documented in 2020 uh, by Cook et, et al. 2020. And you could see here this blue area is the presence of white mold gall midge. And as the common name suggests, it feeds on white mold. And it's really important to distinguish this insect and its orange larvae uh, from soybean gall midge because white mold gall midge is not a pest. Uh, because it only feeds on white mold. It can also be found on different parts of the plant, so not just on the base of the plant, but uh, higher up wherever white mold is present. Um, and, and the white mold can disappear. If we get hot, dry weather, it may disappear from the plants. And so be important, if you're ever in question, contact your extension specialist um, or, or get a hold of myself and we can, we can help you with an ID. This one also has a different distribution. So wherever white mold is present in the field, you may find it. Obviously the adults look a lot different, but you're not likely to see the adults. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're difficult to catch unless you're utilizing some cages. I'm gonna move on and transition between the vegetative and reproductive stages uh, for, for pest issues to talk about soybean defoliators, which is a, a fairly big thing with soybeans and a lot of focus is placed on this. And you can see a whole range of defoliators on this slide. Our bean leaf beetle is still here and will be here through the reproductive stages. Uh, we have various uh, lepidopteran pests, whether it's yellow striped armyworm that you could see here, or the thistle caterpillar or fall armyworm that may show up at different points during the season, green clover worm. Uh, and we have some blister beetles, grasshoppers, and several other insects that are on here that are just some of the defoliators uh, that we may see in soybeans throughout the course uh, of the year, depending on the region and area uh, that you're located in. And so each one of these is important in their own biology and ecology, and obviously we're not going to cover all that today, uh, but I'm going to give you some highlights that maybe give you some insight into understanding uh, their relative role in, in terms of making management decisions or things that you might want to take note of when you're in a soybean field looking at defoliation. Now, uh, with all of these defoliators, one would ask, how would you ever possibly scout for so many different insects? And so that brings us to this next slide, which is actually we base this on the injury that occurs to a soybean plant rather than all the different species that you saw on the previous slide. And so we're going to walk through a graphic uh, that, that breaks apart how to sample an individual soybean plant and, of course, multiple plants within a field to gain an understanding of the, the defoliation that's occurring. So one of the first things to do is to take trifoliates, uh, individual leaves from the top, middle, and bottom of the plant. And why would we do that? Because some of the insects you saw on the previous uh, slide are present at different points in the plant. For instance, bean leaf beetles up near the top of the plant, uh, or Japanese beetle uh, uh, is up near the top of the plant and feeds uh, towards that surface area. Same with thistle caterpillar. Other insects, loopers, and other things can be present near the bottom of the plant. Um, and so it's important to take that whole plant into account uh, because often, and especially with growers, that windshield scouting, uh, they can see a lot of damage along the edge of the field, but it's actually only the top part of that canopy that's receiving injury. And so we want to take each one of those leaflets and then for each leaflet, we want to pull off only one leaflet uh, from that, that particular set. Uh, we want to remove the highest defoliate and the lowest defoliate and take that average plant, uh, average leaflet with us. Uh, and we want to do this uh, for each of the leaflets on the plant. And so this is just one of 10 random plants in one spot in the field. Uh, and then the most difficult part of what you need to do next is estimate the defoliation uh, and, and average that across all the leaves that you're looking at. And so that can be pretty difficult because I bet most of you looking at the, the example leaves across the bottom here would say, no way that last plant is 50%. That looks like a lot more. Uh, but they've actually used a computer to determine the, the amount of, of leaf tissue removal in each one of these animated images. Uh, and so this is something that requires a bit of training, uh, even for myself as somebody who's seen a number of years in a soybean field uh, to, to go over each season. 
And as we do this process, this is one of, of four locations that you would want to look at within the field. Uh, because again, some of our insects are, are edge feeding insects. They're going to be along the edge of the field and not equally distributed. And it's important to take that into account. And sometimes we may limit our treatments to the spaces where that injury is occurring. The other important thing to point out as we bridge between the vegetative stages and the reproductive stages of soybeans is the change in threshold, the amount of defoliation that, that needs to occur in order for uh, a treatment to be applied. And these are not hard numbers, so don't look at it as exactly 30%. It can vary 5 to 10% in some cases, depending on the, the, the size of the soybean plant, so how much leaf area is present and to be captured. Um, or the weather conditions that, that are coming up, uh, among other factors that may change that. But 30% defoliation, the vegetative stages, then we lower that threshold to 20% uh, in the reproductive stages of soybean. So I mess, mentioned earlier that estimating defoliation is a skill that you continually have to, to test yourself. Uh, and the Crop Protection Network has a great resource that you can, you can pause and write down this this uh, link on the bottom here, I, I highly recommend you visit this. Um, and knowing that we all overestimate uh, defoliation, which uh, I mentioned in the previous slide, this takes you through a quiz uh, where it'll give you varying levels of defoliation and you can uh, attempt to, to, to guess the right number and, and to, to promote you to see if you can do better than I did. My scouting accuracy uh, just taken a couple days ago was about 80%. Uh, the average question was about 36.2% defoliation. And me knowing that I overestimate, I actually ended up underestimating. So I need to take this test again before I get out uh, into the field to best uh, hone my skills for, for insect defoliation. So highly recommend you, you try this out and, and share it with others. I haven't said a lot about the insect species that we might be picking up uh, in these fields, but there's a lot of important information you may want to collect from that field that'd be useful to your advisor and yourself uh, when you attempt to make a, de a decision on what to do uh, if there's a number or some defoliation or a number of insects that are present. And you notice an image of a sweep net uh, present. A sweep net, uh, as you've heard in other insect talks through this, this training, is a critical tool to have in the field. And the reason it's so important is it can collect a lot of different things. Uh, I have at extension events had growers walk through, uh, consultants as well, walk through a soybean field, a small 40 by 50 foot area, picking up as many insects as they could as they went through, placing them in a bag. And then I followed them with this sweep net. So they'd already disturbed the canopy and other things. And I could sweep as much in that net as 20 of them could walking through the plot. And so this is really an indispensable resource. And why is it so important to know what's in that uh, field is because you're gonna get an understanding of what species are present. And granted something like bean leaf beetle or Japanese beetle is gonna feed the same amount each day or roughly thereabout throughout its life cycle. Whereas a lepidopteran like thistle caterpillar may eat a lot in its last few stages of development. And so if you're picking up a lot of small larval stages of it, you know you may want to scout that field quite frequently in case that insect uh, continues uh, its uh, activity in the field. You also get an estimation of the abundance, so how many insects are present, if there's any beneficial insects that are present, which are important as well and whether or not they're still actively feeding. If they're becoming diseased or other things, that may change the tone towards uh, what might be needed for management. And of course, at an agronomic standpoint, the soybeans themselves, the stage of development, which is important for thresholds, the size of that canopy, how big that canopy is, uh, is important. The larger the canopy, the more uh, defoliation that can tolerate. And then notes on the weather, as well as what might be coming, which could be an indication of, again, biological agents becoming active, uh, or the stress that that soybean crop may endure. So our bean leaf beetle is back. We've been talking about it as a defoliator. Uh, it has two adult activity periods during the course of the summer or two in a partial generation each year, again, overwintering as an adult. But it's important as we get into the reproductive stages that we acknowledge that this insect also feeds on pods. And so pod damage uh, reduces seed quality and yield. Uh, and it's an important factor to consider. So it, it'd be a good idea if you're seeing bean leaf beetle in your sweep net to take a look at pods and see if they're causing any injury. There are good thresholds for this insect that you can look at if you start to see this uh, in, in soybean fields. 
And just to compare and contrast that with a lepidopteran like painted lady butterfly or thistle caterpillar, which is the immature stage, uh, there's an individual egg laid on a leaf. Uh, this caterpillar feeds for two to six weeks and has a pupation period that ranges quite a bit, uh, but it tends to aggregate, aggregate, uh, aggregate uh, towards the field edge. But as I mentioned, the reason I bring this back up again is that 97% of its consumption occurs in those last two larval instars. Uh, and so it's really important to take into account if you're picking up other lepidopterans, even like this one, that you uh, understand how big they are and whether or not they're feeding uh, is going to continue. And if, for instance, you pick them all up and they're all really large, you may want to consider the fact that they're probably almost finished feeding in the field. And so there may not be any more a damage to be uh, accounted for in the time that a spraying could occur. This insect's also unique in the fact that it curls all the tissue together, winds it together with some silk. And so you may say, see that in the field uh, this summer. Moving away from our defoliators and into our last couple insects that we'll talk about, one is Decti stem borer. This insect is unique, it's a small beetle, uh, and then it's actually native to, the, the, uh, to, to North America. Originally found on sunflower and can be found on ragweed and cocklebur and other weed species. Um, it moved on to soybeans in a number of different areas and has been doing so in the, in the US here for, for a little while, first starting in the, the 2000s. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty small. I hope that's indicated by this image. You can actually see the trichomes on this leaf. So sometimes our images that we produce in PowerPoints make these things seem really large. Uh, this insect emerges, you know, late June, early July. It uh, initially finds the, the petioles of the leaf that connect to the leaflets that are out here. It chews a small uh, notch and then lays its egg into that that small space and the larvae or the egg hatches and the larvae initially burrow inside of that uh, leaflet or uh, petiole. And in the process of feeding through the petiole to get to the main stem, uh, they cause a lot of damage and eventually the petiole will die. Uh, and as a result, one of the diagnostic features in looking for this pest is these dead trifoliates or a dead trifoliate amongst an otherwise healthy canopy. And this is another one of our edge infesting pests. So you're gonna see this along field borders. Um, if you find a plant like that, it's good to, to pull it up, cut the main stem in half and open it up uh, to see if the, the larvae are present. Um, it's gonna feed up and down that stem through the course of the, the summer. And as we get near maturity, it'll move down near the soil surface, turn around and girdle off the plant. So as it girdles that plant to prepare its overwintering site, um, it can and, and will cause those plants to potentially lodge, especially if we get any bad weather prior to harvest, uh, wind or other things. So narrow row spacings and other things can help uh, in managing this insect, but this is, a, this is a tough one to manage in the field. Another one I'll mention is soybean aphid. This is the only colonizing aphid that can be found on soybeans here in the US. Um, and you can see they can grow to very large numbers. In recent years, they haven't been as big of a problem. I think more Minnesota areas seeing a lot of these, uh, but in Nebraska and other areas, we don't see as much of this insect. There are a lot of beneficial insects uh, that, that feed on this uh, and they quickly get parasitized, but you can see they have a lot of generations each year. Um, and so this is an important one to scout for. There are a number of different scouting techniques. Um, you may find as you come across this that it's, in patches, very uh, solidified patches in the field, depending on its introduction. Um, and there's a lot of neat things with that, that particular species. One other one to mention is stink bugs. You may run across a number of different species. They show up around the R1 stage. That's when they become attracted to soybeans, the flowering stage, often along field borders. Uh, they have piercing sucking mouth parts, so they'll feed and damage uh, the seeds and pods. Uh, there are some good thresholds that are being established for this insect. You can see lots of variation within a species. The immature stage can look a lot different in each one of these. Uh, and so if you're carrying your sweep net, you're likely to pick these up in soybean. It's good to, to bring them back for further clarification on what species it is. Uh, and you can, you can refer to the thresholds for these as if you find them. Of course, the, the common name stink bug gives them kind of a bad name. There actually are some beneficial insects out there that, that is a stink bug. So I bring this one up because it looks very similar to, to our, our brown stink bug. It has some pointy shoulders and in particular, its style, it looks a lot different uh, than, than the others. Uh, so you may wanna turn these over. There are good diagnostic features available online to separate these, but the spine 
soldier stink bug is, is a real good predator to have in the field. So if you pick up stink bugs, don't immediately think pest. Um, that one uh, is, is a good one to find in the field. And, and if you didn't think it was a pest for some reason, there it is actually feeding on a, on a uh, caterpillar. And so they produce a, a lot of potential benefit in the field. I see them each year uh, in my tour. I wanted to, to indicate that as you run across insects, that sweep net's a value because you can pick up other beneficial organisms uh, in that sweep net that may help uh, you and your, your uh, collaborators that are in the field understand uh, part of that management decision. And so we have the, our spine soldier stink bug from our previous slide. We have our minute caterpillar, which is a, a one that uh, will also uh, bite us on occasion. And so if you find yourself slapping your shoulder or, or these can show up in your backyard too. Uh, these are a pretty rigorous predator in the field. Uh, lady beetles, that probably doesn't look anything like a lady beetle that you know, but that's actually the immature stage. They kind of look like little alligators. I usually get a call or two each year indicating, I think I have a pest uh, and it's usually these, uh, but they're great uh, to have in the field, a, a great beneficial insect to have. Some surfid fly larvae, the adults of these hover in the field and you may see them on occasion. And then entomopathogens are, are always a welcome sight in the field. Thistle caterpillar can really get knocked down by these uh, as well as woolly bears and others. So this is an important one that you may pick up in your sweep nets or looking through uh, the field that may, may change how you look at management for that particular insect. So to summarize, insects can be found on all different parts of a soybean plant. You know, those Japanese beetles can be up near the top along with thistle caterpillar. Other insects range throughout the canopy, uh, that soybean gallmage near the base. And then early in the season, we have our below ground insects uh, that, that we may see depending on the, uh, some of our weather conditions. Uh, sweep net's a great uh, uh, tool to have in the field. It helps us with that critical information. Other thing I wanna mention is that uh, a number of these insects are good examples of edge infesting pests. So if you stick along the edge and don't walk out of the field, you can get a very different picture. It's important to walk those fields. And, and then also with that defoliation in soybeans is often overestimated. So use that uh, tool that I mentioned and, and walk through that website in terms of, of setting yourself up for, for good defoliation estimates during the summer. With that, thank you. Mm -hmm.